Hello everyone, and welcome to my study of dynamic opening play. The game that I'm going to be using is one of my old games that um, ended up being pretty instructive for me, so I wanted to share it with everyone. And um, I guess we should just get down to it. So, the opening was a Moscow Sicilian, which starts like this. Most people are familiar with the Sicilian defense, where you just play c5 on move 1 against e4. Um, the Moscow Sicilian is initiated by white, and it's with the move bishop to b5 check. So the reason that this is unique and deserves its own name is because generally when you play bishop b5 check, your intention is not to um, play d4 and exchange in the center and get knight takes d4 <clears throat> the way that you do in the open Sicilian. And it's also not the same as the closed Sicilian, where you forego knight f3. It's a completely different system, and black has a few different replies. Of course, queen d7 is a joke, but the other three are serious moves, and they're all different from each other. In this game, we're going to be looking at this definitive of this uh, Moscow Sicilian with bishop d7. So with bishop d7, essentially it's the most forcing option for black, and they're provoking white to trade the bishops. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, long ago, I used to try out moves like a4 just to be even more pro provocative. I thought that this a4 move was generally useful. And I scored my first ever win against a, a player over 2,000 in this line. Uh, but I think I just got lucky and that bishop d7 is a much better move. So here you could take with the knight or with the queen. And the most aggressive option is to take with the queen. The reason is that you have to think about where this knight belongs. Does it belong here or here or some other place? And it turns out that the most reasonable place to put this knight is on c6. So using the queen makes more sense. Um, so after queen takes d7, white castles very quickly. And this is probably a, a good spot to stop and wonder why white did all these things. Because it's pretty well known that to take is a mistake, so to speak. So why did white just uh, trade the bishop so quickly? Did it really make any sense? Well, when they play bishop b5 and bishop takes d7, they eliminate both of the light square bishops, so they haven't conceded the bishop pair or anything like that. Um, what they've conceded is an extra move to black, because they moved the bishop twice. They played bishop b5 and then d7, and that's it. In the meantime, black is moving their bishop and then developing their queen. So they gave up an extra move. What they get in return for it is they get rapid development. They've castled their king very quickly, very effectively to the king side, and they want to take over the center in a way that wouldn't be possible if they didn't play bishop b5 and bishop takes d7. Um, for instance, if black plays knight c6, as in the game, white can continue with c3. And this move c3 um, is controlling the d4 square, and so it's declaring white's intention to play d4 with support from the pawn. That means that they won't have to have the 2 versus 1 in the center, which is very common in the open Sicilian. Just for comparison, we can go back. And after d6, they could have played d4. And here we see that white has one central pawn and black has two, which usually um, gives black better endgame prospects. And I've even found that the extra center pawn is pretty sensitive. But c3 um, shows white's intention not to give up that central mass. The downside is that black is a little bit ahead in development compared to what they normally would be. And this move knight f6 is kind of highlighting that. If the development was on par, probably we would be in a position like this only if white's rook was already on e1, or where they had already played d4, something like that. But here it comes with a threat, and so white has to manage this threat somehow. Um, there are lots of ways that people have tried in the past to handle this threat. Um, but the most popular ones to be to. Now you might be wondering why use the queen. Well, if we play e5, 
that's just a free pawn. Probably they'll take it with. Mm, yeah, probably. They'll take it with and so he's lost a pawn. The reason it's not d3 has a lot to do with what this uh, video is about today. And it's that this move is not a very dynamic move. Black is going to be able to continue their development uh, very rapidly since we are kind of, it's like we declared our intention to play d4 and then settled on playing d3. So a lot of the aggressive dynamic potential in the position is going out. When I talk about dynamics, I mean using threats and temporary features of the position that are going to disappear very soon in order to eventually reach some kind of concrete advantage. Um, so for white, they wouldn't want to play d3 if they're going for something dynamic. You don't always have to play dynamically, but in some positions you just do. And I think this is one of them. If you don't play d4, black is going to easily get their king safer, which is a temporary disadvantage that black has. One of the things I said that was good about the opening is that white's king got safer than black's right away. So if we don't open things up, we can't get to their king. We can't show why our opening play was uh, principled. So d3 doesn't make a lot of sense um, just for kind of abstract reasons, but it makes sense if you think about it. Um, and the move rook e1 is generally not that desirable because it turns out that the rook is better placed on d1. Besides, we don't know where we want this queen. The reason that the rook is better placed on d1 is that it's going to be eyeing this queen on d7. So that highlights some of black's issues from the opening and having their queen placed on d7 in the first place. So if we're, if we're going to try to say that um, giving an extra move to black doesn't matter, this is the way to do it. You need to. Now here, black played g5. And this is really the thing I wanted to focus on for the dynamic side of things. This move is a very dubious move, but it makes some sense if you think about the principles of dynamic play. Frequently when you are going to play dynamically, you need to give up some small amount of material in order to make the opponent's pieces uncoordinated and get all of your pieces into a striking position, and then later either regain that pawn or get some other kind of tangible advantage. In this case, the reason that black is pushing this g-pawn is because they want to open the g-file. They want to go after the king. It makes a lot of sense. And this kind of play is very difficult to refuse. Um, for instance, if white plays a move like d3, then we're going to see g4. If knight g5, you can six traps the knight. That's not good. And if they play, for instance, knight e1, which is pretty reasonable, they might play h5. And there's going to be just a complete pawn storm on the king side that is many moves ahead of what it would be if this arose in a different kind of position. Normally, in a position where someone starts storming with the pawns, um, their opponent already has more or less completed their development. But here, these pieces are just chilling, not doing very much. So you can't really ignore it. You have to do something about it. But in this game, they didn't take the pawn. They which is a very dubious decision. Just for comparison, I want to talk about why knight takes g5 makes a lot of sense, and also why black made the decision to play g5. So there's another opening variation. Let me see if I can find it. One second. So in, in this position, we need to, I'm sorry, instead of c3, sometimes people play a move like queen e2 right away. Then after knight f6, they play rook d1. Now, in this position, g5 makes a lot of sense because there's a tactical resource that black has in response to knight g5, which is not available in the other position. And that move is knight d4. This is a very strong move. Black gets essentially full control of the board um, from here on out after this move knight d4. With the threat knight c2, immediately hitting the queen. There are some real problems here. I guess they would have to play a move like queen d3, but this move looks highly suspect. So I think that probably black has already gotten everything that they could possibly want in the position. Um, maybe one reason this 
is a, is a suspect move is that queen g4 is attacking the rook and the knight, and it's not that easy to save both of them. For instance, knight f3, rook g8, they're just getting hammered. It's not very good. Um, but in the position that we're looking at in the game, after knight g5, there is no move knight d4. Because the pawn on c3 is stopping it. So rook g8 is probably the most logical. And after this, d3. would lead to some counterplay for black. But the move f4 will probably keep the position more in white's favor because they'll still have more space. They will still have a, a pretty clear way of developing their pieces with bishop e3 and knight d2, or even some other more exotic way like knight a3 to c4. There's lots of different options here that are not present in the in the other position. So if we just compare these quickly, um, there's more dynamic potential in one position than the other. And I just want to talk about how we can recognize that. So, so in this position after g5, there are some additional attacking prospects. Basically, I'm looking at these three moves as the main ideas. Um, that black has to fight with. There are more, but it depends a lot on what they do. So I'm saying that we would like to play these moves if we can. Maybe these four moves. But, and these moves we cannot play any time. It's not like this is the basis of a simple plan that we could execute without even sacrificing a pawn. If I played a simple move instead of g5 as black, such as castling long or e6, then white would play c3 and then d4 would be off limits. Or they might play a move like d3 or d4, and then I would not be able to play g5 a move later. So these are dynamic features. That's why I wanted to highlight this. These are dynamic aspects. And the reason that one position has more dynamic potential than the other is basically that in this similar position, the attacking ideas are much more limited. because we don't have knight d4. So this is a big difference, it turns out. And in the game, white should have played knight takes g5, g8, and probably f4. But in the game, they played e5. So this brings me to another thing about dynamic play. I think some players wonder, why should I even play dynamic chess? Why does that help me? Why don't I just play safe, solid? Uh, they might name some chess players like Botvinnik and say, why don't I just play this solid, simple chess? Some Smyslov chess. Um, which is not to say that those guys never played dynamically. Uh, nothing's farther from, from the truth. But um, the reason that dynamic chess makes sense is that sometimes your ambitious goal of winning a chess game against another human being with power similar to yourself um, requires you to take some dynamic risks. It's a tool in your arsenal of ways to play a chess game. And if you don't have any understanding of how to use the tool of dynamic imbalance, you're going to be missing out on a lot of full points because some positions ha are full of latent potential to do something dynamic. And ignoring that will leave you with maybe a worse position if your opponent is able to now play dynamically against you or you could just get a draw in a position where you had winning chances. Um, and I also want to highlight something. Dynamic chess is also very practical because while it puts more pressure on you, it also puts more pressure on your opponent. In this game, white was confused by the move g5, it seems, and ended up doing something that gives away their um, strong central position in just one move. The move e5 in this kind of Sicilian structure generally doesn't make sense. You're spending extra time. That's a dynamic feature, you know, time. It doesn't last forever. Um, so when you play e5, black just can either take it off. Like, let's pretend that they take it off. That's not what happened in the game. We just, we just trade the stuff. If you trade all these things, your, your central space is gone. You know, you don't have that pawn anymore. Your space is defined by the area that is 
surrounded by your pawns where you can safely maneuver your pieces. And now that's gone. No, no pawn, no space. Um, and even if black doesn't take it, then this is just an extra move that they can spend to do something dynamic like knight d5. The reason I say this is dynamic is that this is a very temporary opportunity. White could take over the d5 square at any time and reaching the f4 square is not necessarily that easy. It's not something you can do just any time. Um, we're taking advantage of the fact that this bishop is temporarily blocked to play knight f4. Now in the game they play queen e4. And <clears throat> I think that after knight takes g5, there's a very interesting resource that I'd like to point out, and it's rook g8. And if they play a move like knight f3 or knight takes h7, there's rook takes g2. And this is sort of a critical hit, so to speak, because after he takes g2, knight f4 wins considerable material and leaves black still in a dynamic position where they can play a lot of aggressive moves. It's not going to be an easy game for white after, for instance, maybe queen g4 here, or a simple move like knight takes e5. This knight is pretty out of play. Um, and maybe it's even possible it immediately. Like maybe after f3, queen g2. There might be something here. I'm not seeing it offhand, so I think I'm just going to move on. You guys can figure it out yourselves, I'm sure. Anyway, so that's a resource that would never have appeared if we just played simple, uh, strategic, slow chess. It had to happen by taking advantage of temporary features of the position. So they played queen e4 here. I thought that d4 made more sense because I could I'd probably respond with g4 and g5, capture on d4, and they could try to do something dynamic where they mess up the pawn structure for black and get some counterplay. I thought this was a very interesting line where black is just getting killed if they don't play castling, knight f7 and knight e5, holding on just by the skin of the d They get tripled pawns, bad at clicking. But it's not necessarily that bad. It's definitely much better than what would happen if they didn't play knight e5 and get the tripled pawns. At any rate, so they play queen e4. Pawn takes e5 is a tactical solution to the attack on the knight. It's a discovered defense. And like I had mentioned before, when, when the pawn gets advanced, white space begins to diminish. And even the move knight takes e5 is not utterly terrible here. But black can do much better with queen e6. Now there's a pin. This is the kind of stuff that only happens from making dynamic decisions. And it was all a direct consequence of g5. The g5 move made it very messy, but mostly for white. They played rook e1, and the attack just keeps going. After f5, I seem to recall that this game, which I played about two years ago, um, I seem to recall that my opponent didn't think very long before playing queen e2. They were not really calculating anything. They didn't sense any danger. And that's pretty typical for players who are not familiar with methods of dynamic play. They tend to oversimplify, make quick decisions, not calculate anything. So if you're playing someone like that, um, making things purposely dynamic in the opening while you're still within your preparation is generally a good idea in my opinion. So after f5, they could have played a good move. Let's just see what happened in the game. Um, they played queen e2. And after knight f4, queen e3, queen takes e5, queen takes e5, knight takes e5, queen takes e5, knight d3, they were sunk. It's a deadly double attack, and the knight's guarding the only square of guarding the bishop. The rest of the game was a wash. I'll just show it briefly. Um, even though white gets some pawns for the piece, it's not really a, a fair exchange. First off, black could take a B pawn, but that would give white a chance of developing their pieces, so castled instead. And white continued to play these very weak moves, trying to hold on to their material advantage, and walk directly into a piece trap with knight of four. 
the rook is completely surrounded in this position that they can't go anywhere because of these two minor pieces. Well, and, and some help from the from their friends, so to speak. Um, so they ended up just losing the rook completely. Just an exchange, and they resigned here, even though they had a lot of time on the clock, because it's just an utterly hopeless position to play. Now let's let's go back to this last moment where things could have gone differently. The key to survival here is to recognize that there are some temporary resources that need to be used in order to avoid this dangerous uh, attack the defender combo finished with a double attack on d3. And the key is to pin the attacking piece. This knight is attacking the other knight. They can't take it if it's in a pin like this. So this move queen a4 would have made a lot of sense. Maybe they made a quick rash decision and thought, okay, after castling, there's no pin anymore, I'm going to lose it anyway. But, you know, what's wrong with playing a move like d4? If your position's worse, you may as well at least do something where you don't lose the piece immediately. Um, and there's also the possibility of moving like knight d3. Definitely there are options here that were not even explored. In fact, after queen e2, knight f4, they could have played queen b5, pinning the knight again to avoid losing something. Um, so I'd say that the, the entire reason that White lost this game was because they were not prepared to make some dynamic decisions. And that's all that I have to share for now. I made this video anticipating that I'll be out for a tournament sometime in the near future, and I didn't want to leave people hanging, so I thought I'd just make something quick and share it while I'm in the middle of my game, schedule a premiere. Um, anyway... So if people have questions, feel free to send me a message on Lee Chess or leave a comment here on this YouTube video. And if you like this and you want to see even more, I have literally thousands of games that I can show and explain and um, a wealth of problem sets to share with everyone. So if you like that, feel free to follow and subscribe. And um, I guess I'll see you guys next time you're on the live stream on Twitch. All right, take care.